afternoon, everyone. For uh, those of you who don't know me, I'm Eve Kerr, and uh, I have the privilege on behalf of IHPI of introducing Dr. David Ash uh, this afternoon for before his talk. And um, I know that there's been a lot of excitement about his talk. Many of you uh, have emailed us wanting to get on his agenda. He's been jam-packed, so we're delighted that he's here today and able to speak with, with all of us. Let me tell you uh, very briefly uh, about David by way of introduction. Uh, of course, many of you know him. David is currently the executive director of the Penn Medicine Center for Healthcare Innovation, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about that center. He's also the director of Penn's Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program, soon to be the Clinician Scholars Program, uh, which is a, um, if you will, a sister program of, of the one we have here at Michigan. He's also a professor in the Perlman School of Medicine and in the Wharton School of Business. And in fact, David has been at Penn since his residency in internal medicine. He was also a Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholar at Penn and earned his um, MBA at the Wharton School of uh, Business at that time. So um, David, of course, has also received many awards and honors, and I'd be here probably way into his talk um, if I told you about all of them, but I just wanted to mention that he is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine, and um, he is also an elected member of the Association of American Physicians. He's the recipient of the VA Undersecretary Award for um, Outstanding Achievement in Health Services Research, and also the SGIM John M. Eisenberg National Award for Career Achievement, and, and many other awards. But I think what's really most notable about David is that he's um, a wonderful mentor, and in fact, there are several people in this room who have been mentored by David during their clinical scholars programs or, or residency. Um, he's a great colleague and a generative, innovative thinker, and I think really that is why you're all here today to hear from him about his research and uh, especially behavioral economics and understanding how patients and uh, physicians make better decisions about healthcare. Um, so we're really very delighted to have him here today and, and uh, honored that he has spent the last day and a half with us. And we're excited to hear about his talk on uh, behavioral economics and healthcare innovation using principles of design to improve health and healthcare. So please join me in welcoming David Ash. Great. Well, thank you, Eve, for that very kind introduction. And thanks to all of you and to the people who I've met. Um, over the past day or so. It's really an incredible honor uh, to come and visit. And I have so many um, old friends here and people who I've wanted to meet for a long time. It really is a tremendous uh, pleasure. I want to give thanks to um, uh, some of my colleagues, Kevin Volp, Roy Rosen, and Raina Merchant in particular, but so many others who've contributed to some of the things I'm going to talk about today. As Eve mentioned, I direct the Center for Healthcare Innovation. I'm going to talk about a narrow scope of our work, mostly related to behavioral economics, but also talk a little bit about the impact of design, designers and design thinking, in part because that's been new to me. Um, uh, as I mentioned to a couple of people, we, ha we have about five designers on staff, full-time designers on staff uh, at the Center for Healthcare Innovation at Penn Medicine. And this is a a, a field, it's a life form I didn't even know existed five years ago. And now I, I don't believe you can run a health system without them. And so I won't be able to give justice to what design thinking has done here because it's not actually what I do. But I become an interested amateur uh, in this. So some typical uh, disclosures here. Um, I'm a principal at Val Health, which is a behavioral economics consulting firm. My institution has received grants from a variety of places. Some <laughs> other disclosures that I just feel I have to get off my chest. Um, so let me, let me start here with a screenshot. Um, so John Corzine was a managing partner of Goldman Sachs, incredibly rich guy, made hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Then he became US senator from New Jersey and then governor from New Jersey. And this is a picture of his SUV that crashed when he was governor in 2007. He was sitting in the passenger seat. He broke multiple bones, multiple lacerations, was mechanically ventilated but managed to survive. And I, I bring this up because it turns out he wasn't wearing a seatbelt and never wore a seatbelt. And uh, state troopers always were, were trying to convince him to wear a seatbelt. And this is, you may think about lots of things about John Corzine if you think about him at all, 
Um, but no one would ever say that he was stupid. And yet there he was, not wearing a seatbelt when everybody, every American knows that seatbelts um, save lives. And so I, I bring this up um, uh, to make a point about the role of education and human behavior. Uh, because I think it's, a, it's an anecdote, but perhaps a particularly telling anecdote. It's not like John Corzine didn't get the memo. Oh, gee, I didn't realize that seatbelts saved lives. Why didn't someone uh, tell me that? So we all know that individual behavior affects health. 71% um, of the U.S. population is overweight or obese. Smoking's the leading cause of preventable mortality. There are more people who die each year from tobacco-related harm than, than all of the American servicemen and women who died during all of World War II. 75% uh, of the roughly $3 trillion we spend in the U.S. on health care each year is attributable to several conditions like obesity, type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease, and cancer. Arguably, all of those have a strong behavioral component. So, and probably for an audience like this, it is not something I need to um, ram down your throats that human behavior affects health. Um, uh, uh, Mike McGinnis and others have, have estimated, and it really was just an estimate, that perhaps 40% of uh, premature mortality in the U.S. is attributable to human uh, behaviors. I mentioned John Corzine and his behavior about not wearing seatbelts. Here's a more medical example. Many of you know the MI Free study, I think a, a recent but in my mind landmark study about that making medications free doesn't increase adherence very much, at least even after a heart attack. So this was Nitesh Chowdhury and others did a randomized control trial of nearly 6,000 patients following MI. Now, all of those patients are going to be discharged on something like aspirin, statin, beta blocker, Plavix, something like that. They got randomized to a standard copayment or an eliminated copayment based on the theory that, of course, paying for medicines must be one of the reasons why people don't take their medications. And uh, what you see here on the screen is that medication adherence with a standard copayment at a year to all three of these or three or four of these medicines was just 39%, which is pretty abysmal after a heart attack. You'd think you'd be scared out of your wits. You just had a heart attack. Here are some medications that have been demonstrated to be effective, and only 39% of people are taking those medicines. That's a sort of sorry state of the world. Reducing the copayment to zero worked but only to about 45%, which I don't think anybody should be satisfied with. So, uh, and in fact, the primary outcome here was, was rates of first major vascular events or revascularization. There was no change at all. We only ca care about adherence for its impact on health outcomes. This, to me, is, is part of the story that it's not just education and it's not just money. The more optimistic story is that I think the science of motivation has evolved over time. So remember our, our early model was that we need to educate patients and clinicians in some cases about what to do and then of course people will do that. If you just tell John Corzine that you should wear a seatbelt, then of course he will wear a seatbelt because any rational person would be wearing a seatbelt when they're sitting in the front passenger seat of an SUV. If we just told people that smoking was dangerous, of course, they would not um, take up smoking. I think an enormous amount of the current CDC budget for tobacco re reduction is related to educating the public that tobacco is harmful. And I would submit that there isn't an American or very few people who don't already know that message. We probably need to move in some cases beyond information and education to change behavior. Standard economics has been you know, using, let's say, financial incentives has been very, very popular. Pay for performance uh, 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 attempts in um, health and healthcare, um, either for patients or physicians, and I'll tell you some of those have been, uh, tell you about some of those, uh, have been widely used for a long time. They do assume a highly rational mindset. It assumes that people respond to transactional uh, interventions, but the MI Free study suggests very limited effect, and there's some other counterexamples. And the field of behavioral economics, which is, I think, where we are now, although I'm much more eager to find out where we're going to be next. But at the moment, I think behavioral economics is the ascendant field, you know, uh, 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 way to think about human motivation. Does not assume that people are rational, instead assumes that people are irrational. But the key principle of behavioral economics that is useful is not the recognition that people are irrational. It's the recognition that people are irrational in highly predictable ways. And it's the predictability of the irration, the, the bad decisions we make repeatedly that, that allows us to be sort of forewarned and therefore forearmed in thinking about uh, ways to improve health and healthcare. And that's what I'm going to talk about um, for the next uh, few minutes. Rational models, I think, very poorly 
describe behavior change, and yet repeatedly we see ourselves making decisions to improve health that assume rationality. And if you look for this in your own work, you're probably going to find that we're assuming rationality all the time. The idea that I'll get some information, I'll process it, and it's going to change my behavior. That's, that's the old approach, to change someone's behavior, change their mind, right? It, we should educate people about the dangers of smoking. We should tell people that vaccination is safe. I don't think telling people that vaccination is safe is what's going to reduce the non-vaccination rates that we see in this country. Instead, I think the mind is a high resistance pathway. That's like, I had to like look up Ohm's law and get the little symbols here. This is like, that this is the worst way to change behavior. The much better approach is to like think about a spinal reflex that doesn't even have to traverse your brain. That's my metaphor, right? So the speed and certainty of responses I think are enhanced when they don't have to traverse cognition. This is a very high resistance pathway. And I think a lot of behavioral economics really aims to do that. So give uh, Kevin Volpe, George Lowenstein, and some of my other colleagues some credit for this slide. I won't go through it in detail here, but I do want to illustrate some of the principles. There are a series of biases that we all have. And once we know those, we can design some approaches to overcoming them. Present bias, myopia, is very prominent, right? If I'm on a diet, this is a little dangerous to do when people are eating lunch. Um, you know, you know, the chocolate, you, you know that chocolate cake in front of you, you know where that's going to go, right? First it's going to go in your mouth, but then where is it going to go? Some place on your body that you know it always goes and you don't want it to go there. And you, you shouldn't do, and yet you eat the chocolate cake, like you're going to eat that chocolate cake because it looks so good and it's in the moment and the weight, the, um, the uh, weight loss uh, approach and the diet can start tomorrow. Framing and segregating um, rewards. We do lots and lots of mental accounting. I don't know if this is true at the University of Michigan, but there are certainly plenty of health plans that offer premium discounts. If you go to the gym, I'll talk more about those. Those are often bundled into your paycheck. If you're paid monthly, you'll see, that on, you'll see one twelfth of that every month, but only if you actually look at your pay stub and it's buried in there with the enormous salaries that they pay people here at the <laughs> University of Michigan. Um, you'd never see it. Um, and yet you can imagine that if you handed someone like a a $50 bill, that might be much more salient than a $500 incentive that was distributed over 12 months. And so the, we can in increase the potency of otherwise transactional incentives by recognizing how people think. People overweight small probabilities. People are horrible with probabilities, right? This is why state lotteries are so immensely popular despite the fact that they return pennies on the dollar. Pennies on the dollar and yet very, very popular. I, I'm not making this up, I saw a bumper sticker that said lotteries are a special tax on people who can't do math. Um, and yet we can harness that, and I'll give you some examples later about um, uh, uh, how we can use lotteries to influence thinking. Regret aversion, loss aversion, status quo bias, I'll go through those in a minute. But they're all biases that we have, we all have these, they're inescapable, no shame in having them. The shame is in not responding to them uh, since we know that they exist. The point here, don't try this at home with your spouse, is that once you recognize that people are irrational, you are in a much better position to help them. Because right? we're limited. We, the rational model is highly limiting. The model of irrationality creates all sorts of opportunities for us to change behavior. And you're also in a much better position to learn from them because they don't operate in constrained ways. So, and I'll give you um, some examples. So here's some design principles. Again, I'm not going to do justice to the uh, ways in which we have, I think, very effectively used designers to improve healthcare. One of them is don't expect people to come to you designed for house calls. And what I don't mean house calls in a literal sense, but so many of our approaches to, let's say, improving physician behavior, improving patient behavior involved, well, if we could just get the physicians to do this, if we could just get the patients to log their sugars, if, if they could just show up for the visit, as opposed to thinking about, well, where are the patients right now? Or what are the physicians doing? How can we bring our processes into, you know, I'll use a, a cliche, into their journey, I think is a key design principle that makes us think, I think, more creatively about this. Keeping it simple is less about helping people decide, and honestly, as I showed with the reference to Ohm's Law, is much more about making sure that people don't have to decide. Uh, that, you know, it's not that I think that shared decision making is crazy. I think it is a high resistance pathway. Um, and then move beyond what people say uh, to what they do. We do lots and lots of experiments 
that are designed to help people reveal their preferences, that bypass approaches that are often used. They're often the, the first aim on your three aims of your R01 is like, I'm going to do focus groups and surveys and ask people what they think, do a needs assessments. I think a lot of the innovation work that the designers have taught me to do is to, is to study people in the real world um, and uh, using things like vapor tests and fake front ends that I won't go into great detail about, but that, that effectively test people's decisions in the moment. Uh, an example would be an example of a vapor test. A lot of these grew out of the online retailing businesses. Rather than create a sweater, that a mustard colored cashmere v-neck sweater that you don't know if anybody's ever going to buy that, um, rather than manufacture that, just put it up on Amazon and then when someone clicks on it to buy it, you know there was demand and you send them an out of stock message. In fact, many of you who have received an out of stock message when you've done some online ordering don't, may not realize that the product wasn't out of stock, it never existed. Companies are using vapor tests to see if you'll buy the mustard colored v-neck cashmere sweater, which actually my wife got me for Christmas last year and it looks wonderful on me, but you know, everything, everything looks good on me. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you can imagine that, st that prevents you from having to build something that, that no one else would buy. And there are a variety of these techniques that allow us to learn from how people reveal their preferences as opposed to simply expressing them. There are some conditions for rational decision making, right? So people who are well educated and informed, not time constrained, not emotionally in, uh, engaged, experienced from repeated decisions with feedback. These are characteristics often of physicians, but much rarely the characteristics of patients. Right? Physicians get repeated feedback. They're not as emotionally engaged as the patients. So we might imagine that our approaches, our design approaches for physicians ought to be different than the ones that we use for patients. More rational decision making lends, lends them itself to education or transactional incentives. Less rational decisions, probably a better argument for approaches in behavioral economics. So here's one. So on that list, status quo bias, on that list of um, uh, biases. People do tend to take the easiest path. Many of you have seen this particular slide. It's from Eric Johnston uh, and others. He's at Columbia demonstrating the level of effective consent for solid organ transplantation across uh, uh, nations in Europe. And some countries, those in yellow, have opt-out policies. Effectively, you are an organ donor unless you say you don't want to be an organ donor. And the ones in purple, um, you have to affirmatively say that you want to be an organ donor. And I don't have to go into length about this particular slide to show that there's a pretty big difference, even like Germany and Austria, you know, different countries. Um, but, you know, look at the difference in, uh, but culturally perhaps very similar, look at the difference in effective organ donation rates. So I was driving home from uh, work one day, driving through West Philadelphia to get to my home in the western suburbs, and I will admit I did not come to a complete stop at a stop sign. And, uh, you know, this, as luck would have it, the Philadelphia police come right behind me, and the police officer asked me to roll down the window and see my license and registration. I pull out my driver's license, and there in block letters under my picture, it says organ donor. And the police officer says, you know, you should take that off your license because if you ever get into an accident and they take you to the University of Pennsylvania, they're going to take your organs <laughs> and, not, and, and not let you live, <clears throat> which is not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> but so you know what I said to him? I said, thank you, officer. Thanks for that tip. What a gone set. I'm going to change this right away. And I didn't get a ticket. Okay, so defaults are also important in um, a high stakes situations. So this is work from a colleague, Scott Halpern in pulmonary and critical care, really brilliant guy. I could not believe he got away with this experiment. Um, took 95 patients with advanced lung disease at Penn, people who, you know, are uh, at, at high risk of having respiratory failure and dying, and randomized them uh, to three different versions of an advanced uh, uh, directive form. In, in one case, it was pre-selected defaulted to a palliative care approach, a comfort care approach. You can see that here. <clears throat> I want my health care providers and agent to treat me by helping relieve my pain and suffering, even if that means that I may not live as long. And if they didn't like that, they could cross that out and select more aggressive care um, if they wanted that. So a third of the people got that. A third of the people were defaulted to the more aggressive care that they could change to comfort care if they wanted. And then a third of the people had a blank form where they just had to check off where they wanted to be. And the IRB let them do this. 
and um, which will turn out to be important, although it's actually always important, but it'll turn out in this particular case. This is a high stakes situation, real patients. You should think about this, you know, if it's you. And here are the results. The percentage selecting comfort care was much greater when they had the comfort care default than when they had the life extension default. You can see that gradation right there. If, you're, if, the, if you were defaulted to comfort care, 77% of them stuck with com had, you know, pick comfort care. This is not supposed to be something that's changeable by like a default, right? This is, you're supposed to think about this stuff. And yet it had a huge impact. And then the IRB appropriately said, you know, you've got to go back to these people and say it was an experiment, you know. And so we went back and said, you know, we're just messing with you. This is what we do here. <laughs> <clears throat> and, um, uh, and, and like two people changed their mind. They said, look, we, we're trying to trick you to like go into this thing. That's okay. That sounds like a good plan for me. Like that really makes you feel a little concerned about what our preference assessment approaches are. It suggests that we can create preferences. Defaults are amazingly uh, powerful. Um, and we can think of ways to use defaults, right? We can list drugs alphabetically, like we might on like an, uh, a, a computerized physician order entry system, or you could group them by indication and order them by cost, a different default. Employees can choose to save for retirement, or we could default employees at the maximum savings in their 401k plans, and they could change it back. If you go to McDonald's and order a Happy Meal, I think you can say, I'd rather have carrots than fries. But McDonald's could, could put carrots there and you have to ask for the fries instead and change the default. I bet that would increase carrot consumption and decrease fry consumption. But of course, the fries are like really good. Um, and that's the problem with the fries there. Um, here's an example of Mitesh uh, Patel, who went to medical school here, um, uh, uh, was looking at generic prescribing uh, at Penn Medicine, which was really abysmal. Uh, and so what each of these lines represents is a different drug and the percentage of the time that it's prescribed as its generic equivalent. And you can see that they vary, but they're relatively stable within drug. And it turns out there was like this switch in Epic or something that, that's, that, that allowed us to do, um, you know, dispense generically. And so like we flicked the switch, like who knew it was there? Who could understand Epic? And um, uh, that was the result. But what's really interesting is that that line is green over there is Synthroid, which many people know is, has like different bioavailability. There's like a, a legitimate reason why you might not want to go generic with Synthroid. So this suggests that people, it's not like people are totally unthinking. There was some thought that went, went on board here. This is, you know, I know that physicians are intelligent people, but this doesn't, doesn't look really good um, uh, for <laughs> physicians. Sorry about that. Um, so, and then lots of, we have, all have these foibles, right? We all know this, like you set your alarm at 7 a.m. so you can go to the gym or write that paper or whatever it is, or maybe it's 5 a.m. for you guys. Um, uh, and you know, you know what happens, right? These, these clocks actually have snooze buttons on them for exactly this thing, which is that our present selves are different from um, our future selves. Uh, there are solutions, right? We all know this. We all know that we do this. And so there are solutions that are based on the fact that we know this. So, you know, one of them is you set, you know, alarm clocks all over the place. Um, and that's, that's a behavioral economic approach to knowing I'm going to do this. I like this one. I could not believe I found this on Amazon. <laughs> this is a, a actual device. You can hit the snooze button once, but otherwise it gets, it has with it jumps off your night table and runs around bleeping. And I talked to someone who said that it's the most annoying little thing you can possibly imagine. But it's like brilliantly designed, although not so brilliantly, because I checked again when I updated this and it's down at 1498. <laughs> How many shopping days before Christmas? This is a great stocking stuffer um, for someone and for the holidays. Um, uh, I'm going to go quickly because uh, I can see I'm talking too much. But um, commitment contracts, people pre-committing to things, these two, those two plates there have the same amount of food on them, but of course the smaller plates look fuller. And it, Brian, Brian Wansink at Cornell has done lots of great research that demonstrates that people will eat less with smaller plates. And although I don't think we can attribute the entire obesity epidemic to this, it turns out that plate sizes have been getting larger over time. And we know this because if you look at pictures of the Last Supper, the size of the plates compared to the size of Jesus' head as the standard are getting bigger, or Jesus' head is getting smaller over time. I don't know. Uh, Ant abuse is an example of pre-commitment. Of course, you take this, and then 
Uh, you, you get incredibly nauseated if you uh, drink alcohol. Uh, yearly gym memberships. There are lots of things that reflect pre-commitment approaches. Once we know we do that, um, uh, that can help us overcome that. Again, Scott Halpern, who I mentioned with the Advanced Directive Study, just led a study um, that uh, was published um, earlier this year looking at a variety of uh, incentive structures to improve tobacco cessation, in this case, employees of CVS Caremark, a Fortune 50 company, uh, over 2,500 employees. It was a five-arm trial, but basically it was control, a set of rewards you would be paid if you quit smoking, or you could put money down, your own money down, 150 bucks, that would then be uh, overmatched with $650 if you quit. And, and what these results suggest, it, let's, I'll just look at the six-month figure, is that the reward program worked better than the incentive, uh, than the pre-commitment, putting your own money in, but it will turn out that largely because people didn't want to put their own money in, right? P possibly because they knew it wasn't going to work. Um, and, uh, but it, among those who put money down, that was a great signal of motivation. So 90% in this trial were willing to enter a reward program, 17% of those quit. But if you were willing to put money down, over 50% of those individuals quit. And so this suggests that you should start with these pre-commitment devices, and then for those people who don't want to do it, think about reward programs. That's how I would um, think about the results from this trial. Framing of information and delivery of information changes people's thinking. This is a great study out of Canada that uh, suggests that if you take smokers and you deliver information the way we usually do about their lung function, like your FEV1 is like 60% of that predicted, which is like right over your head, um, much less effective than if you say something like, you know, you're 45, but you have the lungs of a 70-year-old, like buried in your backyard. Um, that, that, th that's a much more motivating frame. It almost doesn't even matter what your eight lung age is. Just presenting things in lung age turns out to greatly um, improve smoking cessation rates. So, um, so much of the information that we present is not salient because it's so bundled. I think cell phone bills are a great example of deliberate obfuscation, you know, to try to get you to, I think they're incomprehensible. They're almost as incomprehensible as health insurance plans. If you want to motivate people, you need to have to make, you need to make their rewards or penalties salient. So every April at Penn, I get something that looks like this, which is going to, supposedly going to help me choose health insurance for me and my family. I'm going to have to be I used to run something called the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics. I have to be better than average. I, you know, I gotta, I, I've got to be better. I cannot figure out what the best health insurance plan is for my family. Like, who could possibly understand that? You know, health insurance is a, a, a whole soup of different kinds of terms, and they're all a bunch of little financial incentives. But if you don't understand your financial incentives, they're never going to be effective. I think these are really you know, examples of being far too clever uh, in an actuarial sense. Charlene Wong, who was an RWJ clinical scholar at Penn, did, a, I think, a really clever study in which she looked at what young adults were doing when they signed up for the health insurance exchange in Pennsylvania, which used healthcare.gov. And she had a bunch of young adults come in as they were making their health insurance choices on the exchange and asked them how much they thought they understood each of these terms, like cost reduction plan, HMO, and so you can see these red and yellow and green things are how much they thought they understood it. And then you can see the figures um, on the far left about how much they actually did understand it. So half these young adults didn't know what a deductible was. I'm not blaming them. I think this is confusing. Um, but I will submit that if you don't know what deductible means, you can't make an intelligent choice about health insurance. I don't think it's possible to do that. I think deductibles are confusing, and people, a lot of them didn't understand the difference between deductibles and out-of-pocket maxima, which are very similar concepts. So health insurance is really a complicated thing, and uh, we're, I don't think we're making it easy on people. Simpler programs can be much more effective. I'm going to skip most of this slide, but it does suggest if you pay people to quit smoking in a simple design, they're much more likely to quit smoking than if you don't. That was a study that was done in General Electric where people could get up to $750 for uh, quitting smoking at six months. And GE was so excited about these results that they wanted to roll it out to their whole uh, company, uh, nor, uh, all of their uh, employees in North America. But there was an enormous objection to it. So can you imagine who, who objected to paying smokers $750 to quit? The non-smokers, right. So the, um, a $750 benefit to people who don't smoke, a $750 charge to people who smoke, a $750 payment to people who quit smoking. We could make these economically equivalent, but they feel different. 
to people. People don't like the idea that smokers are being paid to stop something they shouldn't have been doing in the first place, a kind of highly moralistic tone. That was a design question of how we, these, these programs, to be effective, actually, they have to be socially acceptable. Uh, and I think this was a design change that needed to happen within General Electric. Framing matters, right? The class, clergyman to superior, may I smoke while praying? No. May I pray while smoking? Sure. <laughs> Design matters also. So um, Independence Blue Cross is the big uh, commercial insurer in my area. And I think lots of um, insurance plans had programs like this that if you go to the gym 120 times a year, you can get $150 off of your health insurance. I mean, there are monumental design flaws in this program, right? So first of all, it's a single high threshold. You have to go 120 times. 110 doesn't cut it. $150 is actually not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. It's also like 15 months later after I've done this. So this is not likely to motivate the sedentary people. It actually is pretty, pretty daunting. It is a, it's actually a very good design if you want to attract gym goers into your health insurance plan, which I think is what this is. Um, but it's not, it doesn't turn sedentary people into you know, triathletes. It doesn't do that. Um, it's also once a year when gym going is like three times a week. And so this is a design principle. Pace feedback to coincide with behaviors. And I'll talk about a couple of studies along these lines also, right? Most of the chronic conditions we want to engage patients about, let's say if they involve medication or, or most things, they, they require daily medication and, education, and engagement for a very sustained period, years. People have hypertension, have it for the rest of their life. That's unlikely to work through something that happens at the time you refill prescriptions every 30 or 90 days. That seems like that's not the right pace, probably, for principles of motivating behavior that has to happen every single day. We use these pill bottles, actually you can't use these anymore because this company's going out of business, um, that allow us to observe medication taking. This one is called Glow Caps, and, and there's a little chip in the cap that's Bluetooth connected to this round nightlight thing, and then that's a cell phone signal that goes to us. And has some nice design elements, which is that the patient doesn't have to do anything different, right? They're taking their pills is the signal for us. They don't have to log anything. They don't, they don't have to have anything else. They're just the pills are in the bottle, and when they open the bottle, we know at least that they've opened the bottle. We don't know that they've taken the pill, but it turns out that if you've gone to the trouble of opening the bottle, chances are you're going to take the pill. That's a great, again, design principle here, which is it doesn't require anything active, whereas so many of our healthcare interventions involve, like, let's get the patients with diabetes to log their sugars every day, which, frankly, if you have hard to manage diabetes, it's probably because there are lots of things going on in your life, and that's not such an easy thing to do. Easy for some people, the quantified self people who, you know, their electrocardiogram is connected to their iPhone, and, you know, and it shows their steps, and they're tweeting pictures of their breakfast to everybody around the country. Those people have a totally different disease. Uh, they don't have un <laughs> undermanaged diabetes, and they need a totally different um, decision. So, um, uh, with the brilliance of Kevin Volpe and some other people, we have paired these things with regret lotteries to try to encourage adherence. And here's something that we do, and I'll, I'll illustrate in a couple of studies, to try to motivate daily adherence. So if you're in one of these trials for medication adherence, we give everyone a two-digit number, let's say 42. And, and every day, we randomly draw a number between 0 and 99. And if a 42 comes up, which will happen 1 in 100 times, we'll give you $100. And if a, you get a one-digit match, like a four in the first place, like you know, 41, or a two in the second place, like 12, we'll give you $10. And trust me on this, that happens 18 out of 100 times. And the expected value of that little lottery there is $2.80. You can do the math later if you want to. But here's one, and it, we do it every day, and it's sort of fun because people like lotteries, and there's a small probability of a big reward and a big probability of a low reward. It's got lots of bells and whistles. We push it to you. You don't have to do anything differently. And then we add regret, which is you get a message that says 42 came up. Oh, but you didn't take your medicine yesterday, so you don't get the money. And it's, people hate that sense of regret. <laughs> like, oh, I could have had a V8. I could have, I, if only I had done the thing I wanted to do, which was take my medications, I could have won $100. It's extremely motivating and harnesses that. It's got variable reward, lots of bells and whistles. I'll show you some examples. So this is an early study. I wasn't involved in this, Kevin and George Lowenstein and some others, um, looking at incorrect dosing for 
um, uh, patients with AFib on warfarin. And these are not concurrent controls, they're, um, uh, but they're historical controls. You can see 22% incorrect doses, but then with the lottery system, like you know, roughly 2% incorrect doses. In fact, it didn't even matter whether the expect, what the expected value of the lottery was. Right? It, it could have been a $5 expected value, a $3 expected value. It's just the game. It, you know, which, which is another nail in the coffin of traditional economics for these approaches. It's not how much money you might get. It's the fact that you're engaged uh, in this way. These studies used to be done with lots of personnel to do them. We've automated that, and I'll show that, because I firmly believe that what's required to make substantial changes in population health will be some combination of this kind of understanding, almost this design understanding, of human behavior plus technology to create sustainable behavior change. Um, and I don't think we're there yet, but I have a sense of optimism about it um, and uh, illustrate uh, some of that. The basic principle um, that really has driven a lot of what we've thought about is that even people with a chronic illness might spend only a couple of hours a year in front of a doctor or a nurse, but they spend about 5,000 waking hours a year doing everything else in their life. And as we all know, it's in those 5,000 hours that the, our outcomes are determined. So much of our health is determined by what we do not when we're in front of the doctor, but during our everyday life. And yet as clinicians, uh, or as health systems, or what, uh, providers in some sense, we have no idea typically what our patients are doing during those 5,000 hours. And even if we did, we don't have any obvious ways to connect with them and engage with them and change their behavior. But I think that changes now. Um, and I'm pretty excited about some of those things. So we built something at Penn called um, uh, uh, a little, little bit of a play on uh, Ben Franklin, we, who we worship at Penn because he was our founder and because he was a really the world's first behavioral economist. And he had written something called The Way to Wealth, um, which was a primer on achieving wealth by understanding our natural foibles. So he wrote, uh, you know, the taxes are indeed very heavy, but we are taxed twice as much by our idleness, three times as much by our pride, and four times as much by our folly. But then he went on to give some solutions, some prescriptive solutions, and you know these, right? Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. These all came from Franklin. Never leave that till tomorrow, which you can do today. These, this was advice to, to get us out of our rut. A fat kitchen makes a lean will. I like this one. Laziness travels so slowly that poverty soon overtakes him. Um, very, uh, at the working man's house, hunger looks in but dares not enter. So very um, evocative poetry. How many of you know um, Stephen Wright, the comedian? I, I put a picture up there because he sort of had the same hairstylist. <laughs> <clears throat> I like Steve, he had these like cute little aphorisms. He's got a few that challenge this. The early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. <laughs> but, but this is the real behavior. This is the problem we face in healthcare. Hard work pays off in the future, but laziness pays off right now. <laughs> and that's the present bias thing that we have to deal with with medication adherence or retirement savings, and we need to overcome that. So in uh, like an homage to Ben Franklin and the way to wealth, we, uh, Kevin Volpe and I created something called The Way to Health, which is an information technology platform to automate some of this stuff. And we connect with a bunch of peripheral devices, these pill models or Fitbits or blood pressure cuffs or scales. Just for fun, I put a blender there. Like in the internet of things, I have no idea what a blender will tell you. Um, uh, and then it connects with servers that we have. Uh, Jeff Colgren is here. He's done some studies on the Way to Health um, platform. Uh, there are rules engines on these servers. You can get a text message like you won money or you know, um, uh, other kind of messages that might not be uh, monetary. Um, if uh, it trans we transfer funds automatically, it's a really complicated system. We report funds to the IRS. It's, Really pretty neat thing. We've done tons of studies on this, but this is a way to automate. It's a technology platform that allows us to try to get into the 5,000 hours uh, where people live. Here's an example of a study published about a month ago in JAMA. It was a randomized control trial in which uh, we aim to reduce, to improve the uh, LDL management of a large number of patients who had um, high cardiovascular risk. We did this at uh, Penn, Geisinger, and Harvard. You would think these are, you know, arguably good health systems. The patients enrolled in these trials all had primary care doctors. They were all at high cardiovascular risk, and yet there were thousands of these patients at these three centers that had LDL levels that were very, very high, which suggests a sort of failure of something in the system. This was a forearm trial in which we randomized at the level of the physician 
to either a control group that just got these, the patients, the patients, uh, the physicians were randomized and the patients were nested under their physicians, so cluster randomized trial. Those in the control group, the patients got these glow cap uh, pill bottles. Those in the physician incentive arm, the physicians could get over $1,000 per patient. They got to an LDL goal. This was done before the LDL guidelines changed. That's a lot of money. People thought we're paying physicians too much to, to get a patient's to goal. And we said, well, if $1,000 doesn't work, I don't think anything else is going to work. Um, patient incentives, they had this lottery thing where they could, um, uh, if they took their medicines, they were incentivized for adherence, but then they could collect their money if their LDL was, meet, was on the trajectory to meet the target. So we introduced loss aversion. You could win all this money in a lottery, but then you don't get to keep it if you didn't meet the goal. And then a shared incentive group in which the physicians got half the incentive and the patients got half the incentive for goal. So some of you may have read the study, although maybe that's uh, asking too much. Who do you think won? How many say physician incentives? Patient incentives? Raise your hand. Shared incentives and control. Okay, so shared incentives got the most. It turns out like you're all right and wrong. A shared incentives won. Everyone did better, like this enormous either regression to the mean here. The, the yellow is the uh, control group and the blue is the shared incentive. Only the shared incentive group was statistically different from control. Paying pa physicians $1,000 per patient had an effect no different, an LDL reduction, than control. Now this was a little bit of a souped up control because they got these pill bottles. This wasn't total usual care. Um, but that's pretty damning for transactional incentives, I think, $1,000. Um, and this, these are, mod so in some respects, modest effects. So I don't know whether it's a positive study or a negative study. This, this, these are the results. Um, we see the same thing with adherence, but I'll um, skip that. So one of the things that was interesting was that physician incentives were no better than control, a very transactional approach. Patient incentives were no better than control. Shared incentives, each at half strength, are better than control. Um, overall adherence was disappointingly low. And this is a bit of a surprise, like, sort of remember this from chemistry, you know, rarely do two inert substances, when combined, create something active. Um, that's what we have here. Like the physician incentives didn't work at full strength and the patient incentives didn't work at full strength, but half strength each combined worked. But I have a model for this, and the model is this. In this case, it takes two to tango. Behavior is a complicated thing, right? To lower someone's LDL, yeah, someone has to prescribe or intensify treatment. That's typically the physician. That shared incentives worked and physician incentives worked to increase prescription and medication intensification, but it wasn't enough to take people over the LDL finish line. If you gave patients incentives, you improved adherence but it wasn't enough to take people over the finish line. It required both. And I think that was an interesting design finding. So I mentioned some financial incentives, but I want to skip ahead and leave some time for questions and talk about some social incentives, because I think the trouble with financial incentives is often they're sort of inappropriate. In a lot of contexts, you wouldn't pay patients or physicians to do stuff like this. They're expensive. They aren't always legal. They can backfire. And I've been increasingly interested in thinking about designing for social systems um, and uh, want to mention some aspects like that. Here's an example of things backfiring. I love this study done, done in Israel. Many of you who've had kids in daycare know that you have to race to pick up your kids in daycare um, because you don't want to leave uh, you know, the daycare people there watching your son or daughter. And patients are often late. I've been guilty of this um, myself. And so this solution here, and this may happen in daycare centers that you use, is to introduce a fine so that, you know, to encourage parents to pick their kids up. And they did this in Israel. The fine was 10 shekels, which is like three bucks. And they introduced the fine, and compared to the control group, it increased lateness. And I can totally see how that would work. Like, 10 shekels to leave my kid there? Totally. You can have them all night. <laughs> like, what a deal. You know, totally all my pro-social motivation went out the window when for 10 shekels I can, like, you know, go to the gym, write another paper. Um, so, you know, you can really backfire with these financial incentives. So we're engaged in a study that's actually finishing up. Um, uh, uh, the, it's a one-year follow-up study um, trying to um, reduce new vascular events or rehospitalizations in patients following heart attack. Think about that MI-free study. Combination of financial and social incentives where the primary outcome is um, uh, 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 
reduction in um, new vascular events or readmissions for people post heart attack. We are, have enrolled people across the country, 1,500 patients, and again, the last patient will, go, will, will get through 12 uh, months in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, again, we did this on the uh, Way to Health platform, and here's how this works. <clears throat> they all get these glow caps, which you've seen. All the patients in the intervention group get this lottery system where you get, in this case, $50 uh, or $5. It's, it's not the $100, $10 combination, $50 or $5. And then we have this social system where the patients are asked, if they're in the intervention arm, pick a supporter. So they might pick their spouse or a good friend. Someone who's going to help you through this. I would pick my daughter, who's 22, because she's the only member of my family who truly loves me. <laughs> and if, if I miss my medication two days in a row, she gets a text message that says, your dad didn't take his medicine two days in a row. Well, I don't want my daughter getting that message. So you can imagine that that might be very motivating. Plus, if she does get it, she's going to call me up and say, you know, Dad, don't be such a jerk. Um, which, actually, she tells me that all the time. So, um, and then only if you miss for more do we ever have like a social, someone we actually pay, someone who costs us money to engage with that individual. So it, it's, you know, it, it reduces our personnel costs. And, and, I, and the primary outcome is, as I said, new vascular events or rehospitalization. It's, it's a blinded study. I don't know what, I can't tell you what the results are. Um, uh, that'll take us six months, but, um, but stay tuned. But here's, in the meantime, what we can see. So these, this is the MI free study for comparison around 43, 45%. It wasn't, this is artificial, right? It wasn't constant over time, but I didn't know what their trajectory was. But I can observe the adherence now of those people with that, um, that system of glow caps with the same medicines, right? It's all aspirin, statin, beta blocker, Plavix. And here's where we are, which I think is pretty cool. Now, there's a decline over time, but it's still better. Again, I don't care about adherence. I care about what I think adherence helps, which is new, new events. And I don't know the answers there, but the people who thought this was a crazy idea are, are they're not laughing now. Um, and so we're excited about that kind of uh, stuff. This, is, this kind of design work doesn't work for everybody. I mentioned in another context um, recently that if, if you've been admitted six times in the past year with congestive heart failure, there is no app for that. Right? That's, those people who are clinically, personally, socially fragile, they, need very in, they probably need very intensive, high, per, highly personnel intensive work. And then there are people who don't need anything at all. They're totally socially resourced and uh, materially resourced. But there's probably a big, a big group of the population that, that could get some improvement with this kind of scalable technology. And that's, I think, an opportunity um, for all of us. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about making it social. I was going to talk about social media, but I can tell that I don't have time, so I'm going to skip through those slides. But the social stuff is what I've been most interested in from a design perspective. So um, here are some examples. The, um, I donated today. What's, what's social about that? Shout it out if you. What does that cater to? So social status, right? So I get, I get a prize for having donated blood. It might also be socially norming. It might encourage other people to do likewise. It takes an unwitnessable activity and makes it witnessable. Very social. Um, and you can imagine that increasing blood donation. I don't know if it does, but you can imagine that it would. Barack Obama with the Ice Bucket Challenge, remember that, ALS, enormously powerful fundraising effect for ALS, totally brilliant. It had lots of social elements, right? So one of them is you're dumping a bucket of ice water on your head. That's not a, an everyday thing, I don't think. Um, very visible, obviously uncomfortable. You had to be videotaped, right? That was it. You, it was built in social. You had to call three people out. You know, I challenged John Aaney and Eve Kerr and Rod Hayward to donate <laughs> You know, well, Rod won't do it because he's a cheap, but, but John and Eve <laughs> would donate money for ALS work. Um, and it went viral, um, literally. Uh, Movember, right? This is like you don't shave in, in November uh, for men's health. Um, what's this? I mean, you know, it's, it's an ad for the iPod. This is before the iPhone. What was the marketing innovation for, that Apple used? Apple's, you know, obviously brilliant at this. What did they do? Was that? They had white. white earbuds, right? So there were MP3 players beforehand, but they all had black earbuds. And you might have your MP3 player in your pocket, but the visible part 
of the iPod were the earbuds and they were white. So you could tell who was using an iPod. It was a, they made the visible thing distinguishable. Similarly with this, why, why did I show the uh, MacBook Air there? People see the early Mac laptops? The Apple was the other way around. The Apple was around so that when you opened it, it would look like an Apple right set up to you. And then they switched it so it would look right to all the other people. Um, and, and you can think, think about how these things um, would work. Here's an example of, um, you know, I, I think social connections are combinations of cheerleaders, role models, and witnesses that are more or less engaged with you in this particular process. My daughter can be my cheerleader, but she's also my witness. I, ha I take some medicines for some chronic conditions, nothing contagious, don't worry. And um, I take my medicines in the bathroom. That's where I, where I brush my teeth, I wash my face, I take my medicines. It's not witnessed. It's not like I have any privacy about it. I just admitted to you, to you all that I take some medicines. Um, but I happen to do it in a place where no one sees me do it. It's not secret, but I don't have any witnesses for that. And I think a lot of the social stuff that we can do and design to encourage behavior is to make, it, make something that was previously unwitnessable witnessed, because we're all on a better behavior when we know people are watching us. Um, and so we can harness that. So I created this, um, I totally made this up, um, uh, but I'm standing by it, of this ladder of social influences, how to get progressively more social in our design thinking. And so at the bottom of the ladder is you don't do anything social. You take your medicines in the bathroom when you're alone, which is what I think a lot of people do. Um, your outcomes are witnessable to you, right? You wear a Fitbit. You weigh yourself daily. Like, you know, I didn't, I know I walk a lot. I, I, I don't wear a Fitbit right now because the battery died, but, um, and I couldn't recharge it. But I found out that on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I was getting in an extra mile and a half. And I couldn't figure out what that was until I realized that I teach undergrads on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And although I'm not doing it now because of the way the microphone works, when I'm teaching undergrads, I'm like doing this the whole time. And I put in a couple of miles in it. In it's great. Um, but I wouldn't have known that. Um, you commit to personal goals, right? You write your salary aspiration down before you meet with the boss. It turns out that there's empirical evidence that that gets you a higher raise. Write down the number you want, like $725,000 a year, and you put it in your pocket, and those people are closer to $725,000 a year, but they never quite get there. Um, uh, you buy clothing that won't yet fit, right? Um, your activities or outcomes, number four, are witnessable by others. The Apple logo is reversed on your laptop. The Apple earbuds are white. You move your pill bottle into the kitchen where everyone is in the morning. Um, your activities or outcomes are actively broadcast to others, right? You sign up a Fitbit buddy. Um, you systematically tweet about your activities. You tell people you are trying to lose weight. Um, you externally commit to your goals. You announce, I'm going to lose 10 pounds by the summer. It's just progressively social things that you can do. Um, you engage others to help you. You hire a trainer. Or you engage in reciprocal um, support. I know Michelle does stuff with reciprocal support. You, you start sculling in a double. You enter a weight loss pact. These are things that we can think about of harnessing um, social approaches that, again, I think a lot of these have not been tested, but I'm encouraged uh, to test them. Um, Michelle Heisler is a, the, the king or queen, czar, tsarina, of um, peer mentorship, along with Judith Long and some of my colleagues have demonstrated that peer mentorship can be enormously effective for what are otherwise challenging um, uh, uh, chronic conditions. Uh, again, I won't go through uh, that in great detail. I was going to tell you all sorts of cool things about social media, um, um, but you'll just have to invite me back. Um, uh, uh, to highlighting some work by uh, Raina Merchant, but I'm going to skip ahead all that cool stuff. Sorry, see what you're missing? That's my fault. Um, and um, uh, tell you about sort of my sense of optimism for the future is that in 2015 we're waiting for patients to come to us during visits, but there's so much that we can do if we, you know, put ourselves in patients' um, lives with some kind of combination of technology and understanding the behavior um, and the journey uh, that they're currently in. And I do have a sense of optimism about it. Uh, I, th I think we should be skeptical and test this stuff, but I think there's enough reason to be optimistic. And I really do think there are three things that are true today 
that, just, that weren't true 10 years ago that justify this optimism. And, and one of them is we fundamentally do know much more about human motivation than we knew 20 years ago. Behavioral economics is a relatively, well, it's a new name for an older field, but the field itself is not that old in understanding human behavior. Sounds like a cliche, but social media and wireless devices make it easier to touch people. I mean, everyone, everyone in this room has a cell phone within a foot of them. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure that's true. And uh, there are some opportunities there. And then, of course, there are new ways in which financial risk are distributed across stakeholders in the healthcare enterprise that um, create a financial engine for health systems and other groups that have some muscle to care about outcomes here. So that's the third of these is the financial muscle that can take advantage of uh, some of these tools that are up at the top. So I, I spoke longer than I meant to, but I'm really incredibly grateful for the opportunity to visit you at the University of Michigan where you are doing some incredible things that I fully intend to steal um, uh, or borrow uh, with attribution. Um, <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for the opportunity to meet with you. I'll end with this. One of my designers gave me a book and she had inscribed in this book this thing which I thought was great, that good design is really just intelligence and compassion, just like medicine. And I totally um, believe that, and that's why I've been sort of bitten by the design bug uh, recently. So thanks so much. Huh? I know some people have to leave, but if you want to take a couple of questions, if, uh, I think you have the time. If other people um, want to stay, if those who have to leave, uh, go ahead. So, a couple, uh, couple of questions? Any questions? Julie. So, I know you had to skip over, but I'm really intrigued with what the qualifications of your designers are. Yeah, so the, um, most of them have a master's degree in, in design. You know, they what come. design? What is that? Architectural design? Yeah, Industrial no, totally great question, and um, and one I've been fielding a lot recently is, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, there are uh, experience design and industrial design are um, uh, sort of subgroups of design. I think a lot of people when they think about design, they think about you know creating a water bottle, some artifact, or a chair, or a microphone. But there are people who they look like industrial engineers, um, and I think there's been some conversion evolution uh, within those fields. But they um, think about the processes of, of of flow that, that exists and how people use things, whether those are patients or physicians or someone who's going to use a, a, a travel mug or uh, sit in a car seat. Uh, and it's a highly empirical, almost part, they're part anthropologist, part industrial engineer. Uh, and they make great slides because they're good graphically, which turns out to be really useful when you need to make presentations. They didn't make mine, but if they made mine, they would actually look. They would have that garish colors. One last question. As you mentioned in one of your closing slides, the, these principles of behavioral economics, the biases, the heuristics, um, we've behaved as if we implicitly know these things for millennia, but now we understand that there's a science behind it. And, and I'm just wondering, like these heuristics, these biases are used to sell products to us all the time. People are profiting from illness, generating illness. So I wonder, without a sort of social compact to say that we want to use the science to improve our health as a society, why do you think that smart doctors will have more impact than people who just want to make a buck? Yeah, I, I think it's a, um, a, a great question and comment. Um, it, to the extent behavioral economics is a powerful motivator, we need to make sure it doesn't get in the hands of evil people. Um, and uh, it, we need to use this for purposes of good and not evil. And um, uh, I'm being sort of glib, but um, uh, you know, I think we've been sold you know, tobacco and sugary uh, soft drinks for a long time using principles that are similar to this. Um, I just think that we can try to fight those things, but why not try to harness some of the same techniques that we may have had an intuitive understanding of, but we never called it a science, we never created a discipline within medicine to harness these things. I don't know how to stamp out the evil, um, just to be glib about that, but I don't think we should shy away from using some of the same uh, techniques um, for purposes of good. 
Um, and so many of them are actually getting people to do what they fundamentally wanted to do in the first place. Right? So when I was a, an MBA student, I had to take marketing um, because it was part of the requirement. And I was, they dragged me kicking and screaming to marketing class. And I thought this is going to be the biggest waste of my time because I'm not interested in, in convincing Americans to buy one brand of laundry detergent over another. And then I took marketing and I realized, oh my god, healthcare is marketing. Um, what an idiot I was. It's all marketing. Understand what the consumer fundamentally wants and help them get there. And when I think about medication adherence or weight loss or physical activity or any of these things, these are, are marketing challenges. The, the patients want to get there. Help them get there. And, it's, you know, and then people will sell you laundry detergent. That's a different thing. So that's how I make peace with this. Um, we're not building nuclear weapons, but, um, but this is dangerous stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.